Father, I want to thank you for just the privilege we have of serving you. We thank you for technology. We thank you, Lord God, that you are worthy to be worshipped and worthy to be praised. And as we open up your word now, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray, Lord God, that you open our hearts to hear your word, that you would speak through me in spite of me. And I ask, Lord God, that you would do your work, that your word would not return void. So work it in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Well, great. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here again. Uh, we've been doing a, a message on followership, or a series on followership, talking about what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. And last week, Pastor Hunt, as he talked about that we must have the priority in loving Christ more than anything else. So today I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And it's, and it's interesting, as, as we look at John chapter 10, uh, Jesus is Oftentimes when he spoke, he, he related to the community he spoke to. So he, he used, he's speaking to a, a farming culture. And today he talks about, John 10, he talks about sheep. Now it's very interesting in this passage in John 10 uh, that it's actually split in two. So the first part of John 10 up through verse 21 happened sometime in October because they're at in Jerusalem for the, for the, the Feast of Booths. And then in chapter 22, it's a December, around Hanukkah time. But they talk about the same subject, and that's probably why John put them together as he talks about this. But Jesus talks about being a shepherd to the sheep. And I, I find some people uh, sort of joke with me when they find out that I'm from Iowa. And, and I tell them, I say, you know what? Uh, I have never lived on a farm. They said, you know, you only think about farming? I know nothing about farming. I've never milked a cow. I've never seen a sheep. I've never done any of that stuff. Uh, but Jesus talks about what it means to be a shepherd. And so I want us to look, if you would, at verse 27. Uh, and then we're, we'll start there and we'll spring off to other places. Uh, but verse 27 of, of John chapter 10. And Jesus says there, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so there's a couple of things we want to look at here. One of them is the fact that Jesus calls us sheep. That Jesus is a shepherd. In fact, in this whole book, he says there that I am the good shepherd that I am the good shepherd. If you look back in verse 11, he says, and I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. And so he's talking about, I want you to understand, we talk about Jesus being shepherd, that I want you to talk about the shepherd's love and the shepherd's care for the sheep. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 12, he says, and he who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. And so Jesus says there, there are some shepherds or some people who don't care about the sheep, but as a good shepherd, I want you to know I love the sheep and I, and I, and I care for the sheep. In, verse, in verses uh, uh, 15, he says it again. He's, he's verse 15, he says this, Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And he repeats that in verse 17 and 18. He, he says this four times, that he is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. John chapter 15, verse 13. In, in John 15, 13, Jesus makes this comment there. He says, greater love has no man than he that is willing to lay down his life for his friends. And so I want you to know that Jesus loves us so much, he's willing to lay down his life. In Luke 15, uh, Jesus tells a story of, of a shepherd there. And he says, talking about how much the shepherd cares, he says this, that, that, that a shepherd will leave, have a hundred sheep, and if one of them goes away, he'll leave the 99 and go after that one sheep because he loves that sheep so much and cares about it so much. And when he finds it, he says he picks it up, puts it on his shoulder and he carries it back. And then he calls all of his friends and says, I want you to rejoice with me. Now, the interesting thing about that story is what I understand about shepherds was this, that if that same sheep keeps running off. What the shepherd would do then, the shepherd might break that sheep's leg, injure that sheep's leg so that sheep can't, can't run off again. And then as long as that sheep is healing, the shepherd would pick that sheep up and carry that sheep on his shoulders. So by the time that leg healed, that sheep had become so attached and so dependent upon that shepherd that he wouldn't leave that shepherd for one minute. And so Jesus says, I want you to know that I am the good shepherd and I love and I care about my sheep. But then he says there that my sheep hear my voice 
and I know them. Now, what I want to do now, I want to jump to the know them because we have to know them before we can hear the voice. And he says that I sheep hear my voice and I know them. If you look in verse 14 of chapter 10, verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Jesus is saying that, that, that he has a personal relationship with the sheep. He has a personal relationship when it comes to the sheep. Verse three says this. To him, the gatekeepers opens and the sheep hears his voice and he calls his sheep by name. And he leads them out. He has a personal relationship with the sheep and he knows us individually. He knows us by name. There, there, there is that there's an intimacy there that Christ has. Well, I'm not just a number. I'm not just a face, but he knows his sheep. Those people who have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior, who have entered into a relationship where they know him. He knows them personally by name. He calls out my name. There's a parable that Jesus uses. He says, where people come to him, they're going to say, in the last days, I did this and I did all these things. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so those who are his sheep are those people that he knows in an intimate way. Isaiah 43, 1, God says this. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee. I have called you by name and you are mine. That's, that's, that's a loving father who's talking about knowing us in a, in, a, in a great way. See, I think a lot of times, a lot of people have this idea that they know Christ because they know about him. They went to Sunday school class. And they heard all these different things about him. And they know all the facts and all the things that he did. But do they know him personally? Have they ever come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I remember when I was younger, I uh, uh, was a little kid. I used to like basketball and I had a favorite basketball player. The favorite basketball player's name was Walt Frazier. Walt Frazier, some of you may have no idea who Walt Frazier was, but Walt Frazier played for the New York Knicks. And I had an opportunity one time, I went to a camp uh, that he was hosting. And at this camp, I have, I have a picture of myself and my friend, we're, we're on both sides of him, and uh, we're standing in front of his Rolls Royce. He has a maroon and gold Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce and we're standing in front of this Rolls Royce. Now I could say to you, I've met Walt Frazier, but I can't say that I know Walt Frazier. And I definitely know he doesn't know me. If you were to say who Irv Clark was, he would have no idea who you are. And I think sometimes we're like that, especially with the social media and things like that. You know, we may say, we all, you know, I follow this person because I follow this person, I know who they are. I follow them on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And the question would be, well, do they follow you? Well, they probably don't follow you and you probably don't know them. But if I were to go to someone and say, do you know this person? And they were to take out their phone and say, yeah, I know that person very well. And they were to pull your number up on their phone. I said, wow, you know them. But here's the greatest thing about that. You and I have the privilege of knowing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of all the universe, that we can know him. And more importantly, he knows us. He knows us intimately and he knows us by name. So back in verse 27 of John chapter 10, he says there, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. And because they know me, they are able to hear my voice. My sheep are able to hear my voice. Look, if you would, at verse three and verse four, four and five of chapter 10. Jesus says to him, the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice. He calls his sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, all he has owned, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of a stranger. And so Jesus says, my sheep can identify my voice. They're in tune with my voice and they follow me because they know my voice. Do you realize that God has a voice, that God has a voice and he talks to us. And so if we're going to be followers of Christ, and this is the most important part of this message, if we're going to be followers of Christ, we have to be able to learn the voice of God. Now, does God talk to us? Of course, God talks to us. Lily Tomlinson, 
a comedian said this. When, why is it when we talk to God, we call it prayer, but when God talks to us, we call it schizophrenia, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but God does talk to us. And so as Christians, what we've got to understand is how do we hear the voice of God? How is it that we hear the voice of God? And I, I want to give you a few things as we, as we continue on, a few things. First of all, one of the ways we hear the voice of God is by spending time in his word, is by spending time in his word. In, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 2 Timothy 3, 16, Paul says this, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is God breathed and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped to every good work, that, that we may be mature. That all scripture, all scripture is profitable. It's going to benefit us in, in our areas of life. And so one of the ways that we hear God's voice is through his word. God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through all scripture and he's able to take the word and apply the word to our life. But I want you to understand, not only God talk to us through his word, and, that's, and, and this is the main way in which God talks to us is through his word, through us spending time in his word. But the word is also a barometer. The word is also a, a filter in which we filter everything else. Any other kind of communication that we think that God may give us must go through the word and it must add up with the word because God is not going to say anything else to us in any other manner that contradicts his already spoken word. And so we use his word as a gauge, as a filter in that way. So the second way that God's that we talk about how, to, how do we hear God's voice is this. We have to learn how to abide in him. We have to learn how to abide in him. The, the idea of abide means that we remain, that we walk close, that we stay close, we stay connected to him. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5 say this. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, it lets it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And so what we're saying there, we have to abide. We have to learn how to stick close and walk close with God. Because when we do that, this is what happens. We get to know the voice of God. We get to understand his voice. I remember when I was younger, I, I played basketball in high school. And uh, when I went from playing basketball and younger and getting to high school, and I got on the varsity team, our varsity coach did something that was, that was unique. I liked it though. We had closed practices. And a closed practice was he locked the doors. Up until that time, you know, people could come in and watch it, practice. They could yell at you, say things to you. Your parents could. Uh, but he closed the practices. No, no parents allowed. No one else allowed. Uh, the parents could come and they could stand in the hallway and look through the window. But he closed those practices. And one of the things that happened when he closed those practice was we got used to hearing his voice. There were no other voices to compete with his voice. So when he gave us instructions, we heard instructions. When we were doing drills, whether we were scrimmaging, whether we were running sprints, we heard his voice. We heard his voice when he spoke calmly. We heard his voice when he was excited. We heard his voice when he was mad. We heard his voice when he was joking. We got to know his voice. And no matter where we were, so, and, and this is why that's so important. Because when we got into the game, and in the game, you have 2,000 plus people screaming fans in the game and all this noise and all these voices. You have cheerleaders on both sides of the gym. You have you have band that's playing. You have been trained to single out the voice of your coach. And with all that commotion, all that noise, we had learned the voice, whether we were in the huddle or we were on the other side of the court, we could distinguish and, 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 and his voice became, we were in tune with his voice when he gave instructions. And it's the same way with Christ. The more time we spend with Christ, the more we're going to hear his voice and the more we're going to be in tune to the voice of Christ. It's very interesting. My wife watches the, um, uh, what is it, the National Geographic, the Animal Planet Station. And sometimes I sit down and watch it with her. And, and uh, one, of the, one time they were having this the thing on the penguins. And they were talking about how the penguins are all on the beach and there's thousands and thousands of penguins on the beach and they're all making this penguin noise, which I don't know how to even make it, but they make this penguin noise. And, and what they were saying was, the amazing thing was that the penguins could tell the voice 
of their, of their mother. And the mothers could tell the voice with thousands of penguins all yelling and screaming, they could distinguish the voice of their mother. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're spending time with God. Make sure that we're abiding with him, that we can learn his voice, that we can know his voice. The third thing I want to mention to you is this. We have to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, Romans says, says this, For all who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. That when we, God, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, and the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Holy Spirit moves our heart. We are his, we, that's proof that we are children of God. And so we've got to learn how to do that. The story is told uh, in Acts chapter 8 um, of Philip. Now, Philip was one of the deacons uh, that was selected, and, and he went on to be an evangelist. Uh, in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 8, um, in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8, uh, the Lord told, the angel of the Lord told Philip to rise and go south. And so Philip gets up, he goes south, and while he's traveling going south, he meets a, uh, a caravan that is carrying a, a eunuch, an Ethiopian eunuch who, work, who, who, who works for, for the queen, Candace the queen. And it says there in verse 29, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah. And so the spirit, now I want you to understand, I don't know if this was an audible voice that Philip heard, but somehow Philip got the, the nudge of the spirit to go to this man. And he goes over to this man, he's reading Isaiah, and he gets up in, 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 this, in, in, in the, uh, the chariot with him. And he begins to explain the book of Isaiah. And through that, he's able to lead this person to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he even gets baptized. But all of that happened because Philip was able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks, Philip was able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got to be able to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit guides us. John Otterberg, or John Artberg, uh, wrote a book called this, uh, Defining or Determining what is, God's, what is God's Will for My Life. It's a little small book, real easy read. And in, it, he, in this book, he talks about the fact, he uses this term, and I like this term, he uses, he uses the thing guiding thoughts. And what he says is, he says that God, and I believe God through the Holy Spirit, uses words and uses situations to guide our thoughts. In other words, what he does he causes or he plants thoughts in our minds that God wants us to have. And sometimes these thoughts are uh, discernment about situations we're going through. Sometimes these thoughts are uh, in instructions to go or to do or commands to do. Sometimes uh, these thoughts may be about things in our life that God is not pleased with. But God is able to, to plant and, and, and put these thoughts in our minds. And I think that's some of the, one of the ways that God speaks to us. He puts, he puts these thoughts in our minds and, and he uses that to, to, give us his under, to give us understanding of what he's saying. Now, we have to be very careful in that. And we have to be careful because those thoughts may have been a result of the, the two or three pieces of pizza that I ate the night before. And that's why I have these different thoughts. And so I remember I said that the word of God is a barometer. The word of God is a gauge. So even these thoughts that God places in our minds need to be, need to be tested by the Holy Spirit. I mean, by the word of God, we need to test these by the word of God to make sure that they're of God. So in other words, what I'm saying is this, if God's giving you thoughts that you need to give up, that you need to quit, if God's giving you thoughts that you need to, you need to, to do something that's sinful or to lie about something or cheat about something, we can be sure those thoughts are not coming from God. But God does that. I, in my own experience, there are times when I am sleeping, it's not necessarily a dream, there's times where I'm sleeping where, where the Holy Spirit will plant a thought in my mind and it'll wake me up. And it's like, bang, just out of the middle of the night. And I, and I set up at night and I look around like, what in the world happened? But then there's, there's, there, there's, there's a thought that's been planted by the Holy Spirit that's, that's caused me to think that, that, that is, 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 is needed for whatever situation I'm going through, whatever instruction God has for me. Uh, he gives you those kind of thoughts. But even then, I've got to test those things with the Word of God. Now, at, at, at where I am now, I got to get up right now. I got to get up immediately and write it down because if I wait till the morning, I forgot it. And I'm wondering what in the world was that that God gave me? But God speaks to us in those ways.
So I'm not saying that God does not speak to us in audible voices. I think God, God can. I'm not going to put God in a box and say God cannot speak to a person in an audible voice. I think he does. And I think there are times he does. But I want to say that's not the norm. And so if you're waiting, if God has spoken to you in an audible voice and next tomorrow you're waiting for him to speak again, that may not happen again. That's not the norm. But he does place thoughts in our head and guides us with thoughts. The, the, the other thing I want to mention as far as how God leads us and we're talking about how do we know God's voice is this is we need to learn not only to hear the Holy Spirit, but we need to learn to be still. We need to learn to be still. Psalms 46.10, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, Psalms 46.10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I, I think oftentimes some of the reasons that in our life we miss the voice of God, one, because we're not in the Word, but two, we're too busy. We're, we're too, from the time we get up, the time our feet hit the ground, we're thinking about all the things we have to do and we're running all day long until we get back into bed. We never take time to be still. We never take time to quiet our souls, to quiet our spirits and just sit before God and allow God to talk to us. And so if we're going to hear the voice of God, we have to learn that we have to be still. It's amazing. That's what God did to Elijah. Elijah was on the run. In, in, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah was on the run because the queen said she was going, Jezebel said she was going to kill him and he's running all over the place and God finally gets a hold of him and God says, this is what I want you to do, Elijah. I want you to eat something and go take a nap. And he got up and I want you to eat some more and go take a nap. And then he put him in a cave and he was in this cave all by himself. He was still before God. God put him in a place where he had to be still before God. It's very interesting what we're going through now uh, with this isolation that some of us, God has placed in a cave. God has slowed our life down so we can be still and that we can hear the voice of God. And so Elijah, as he's in this cave, he comes out and um, I, 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 believe, I, I believe what happens is there's a storm, a great wind that comes by and, and says that God wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake and that God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire and God wasn't in the fire. And then it says there was a still, small voice that Elijah heard. And oftentimes because of all the noise that's around us, all the noise that's in our, in our world, all the different voices that we hear, we miss the still, small voice and we've got to learn how to be still. Now, here's the great thing about that. When we're still, we get away, we find ourselves, even if it's 10 minutes. One of the things I've been practicing is 10 minutes of silence and 10 minutes of solitude. Just trying to get away. And I, I'm not as faithful as I should be. I, I try to get away, maybe 10 minutes. I set my clock for 10 minutes. I say, no, Lord, I just want to be quiet and still and allow you to speak to my spirit. Now, one of the things I can do, I can cut out the voices in the world. I can cut out all the voices that are around me. But you know the voice I have trouble cutting out? That's almost impossible to cut out? That's my voice. That's, that, that, that's my own voice, my own self-talk. And sometimes, to be honest with you, my own self-talk is not, is, not uh, is not always positive and is not always productive. And so I've got to even learn how, to, how do I quiet my own voice? I, 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 I joke around in the house sometimes because my wife, I, I have a habit of talking to myself. And uh, my wife will come into a room and, Ask, what do you say or who you're talking to? And I, I say, I'm talking to myself. She says, why are you always talking to yourself? And I say, because I'm the only person that listens to me. That's why I talk to myself. Um, but sometimes that self voice is not always the positive voice and it's not the voice of God. And I think that's why in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, God says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all that ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Why does he say lean not to your own understanding? Because you know what? If we're honest, my understanding can be jacked up. It really can. My understanding can be so messed up. It can be so full of the flesh that my understanding is not right. In Proverbs 28, verse 26, Proverbs 28, verse 26, he says this. He who trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. That sometimes we can't trust even the thoughts in our head. In fact, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9, Jeremiah says that the heart is, 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 is wicked, that our heart is wicked. And uh, he, he says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And so we can't even trust our own thoughts. So we have to make sure that we distinguish my voice from the voice of God. And so we've got to learn how to be still and say, Lord, I need you to quiet my mind, quiet my voice,
that I might hear what you have to say. So that's what he says there. Those, those, those are four things. How do I hear God's voice? I hear God's voice by spending time in his word. I hear God's voice by making sure that I'm only spending time, I'm only spending time in his word. But I hear God's voice by making sure I'm abiding with him, that I'm learning the voice of God. I hear by his voice by learning to hear the, word, the voice of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And I hear God's voice by learning to be in silence, to, by learning to be still and be in silence. Those are things we do. And he goes on in verse 20, 27 of, of John chapter 10. He says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. That's the great thing about the shepherd. We're told in verse 3 that the shepherd leads us. We're told there that he goes before us. I'm, I'm so glad that I have a shepherd that doesn't say, You know what? I'll be here. You go do what I tell you to do, and I'll be here when you get back. But it says we have a shepherd that leads us. We have a shepherd that goes before us. And I want you to know, as, as we are even going through this pandemic, that God hasn't left us alone and say, I, I hope you guys make it to the other side and I'll meet you on the other side. He hasn't said that. But he said to all of us, no matter where we are, some of us have dealing with financial issues. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have loved ones who, have, who are sick or, and we're concerned about loved ones. But God says that I want you to know I'm going before you and I'm leading you and I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you. And I'm going to go through this with you as your good shepherd. But he says there that, that the sheep follow, that once they hear his voice, they follow. The, the word obey in, in the New Testament, where it says children obey your, your, your parents and the Lord, the word obey means to listen attentively and then to do what you're being told to do. So the idea of following is his sheep obey him. His sheep hear his voice and his sheep obey him. And I want you to know this is also important for hearing God's voice. It's also important that we develop the habit and the practice of obeying God in order to hear God's voice, right? Because oftentimes what happens, we, we, we want to hear God's voice, but God is saying to us, you know what? But you, you know what I told you in your word already, and you're not even obeying what I told you to do in your word. So why am I going to speak to you when you're not obeying what you already know what to do? And so one of the things that we need to do in terms of hearing God's voice is we need to begin practicing and obeying what we already know, what he already tells us. We need to begin following those things and God will begin to show us other things as we begin to obey. So all of these things God wants us to know as, as, as we go through this. God wants us to know this and that obedience is so important. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through, through, uh, through 28, he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who builds a house on a rock. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it did not fall. So it's not just a matter of hearing his voice, hearing his words, but he's saying if we hear them and we do them, God is going to build security in us. We're going to be able to stand in the midst of whatever trial, whatever storm comes along. We'll be able to stand because we're hearing God's word and we're following him. We're obeying his word. But then it says, but he who hears this word and does not obey it, he says, and anyone who hears the word, these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew against it and the house fell because its foundation was on sand because he never followed, he never obeyed. And so it's important that we do that. So God does want to speak to us and we've got to hear his voice. And every way that we hear his voice, we have to filter it through the word of God. So if you've been with us for a while, you know that often at end of messages, we give an at home. And at home is something that you can talk about around your table, especially with your, with your kids, your teenagers, your junior high uh, age uh, uh, students that you guys can have uh, an opportunity to talk about. So at home, there are two questions I have for you at home that you can discuss. The first one is this. What aspect of hearing God's voice comes most natural for you? What aspect of hearing God's voice comes most natural for you? And then what aspect of hearing God's voice is the most difficult, is, is the hardest for you? And just discuss it. And, and, and here's the thing. We're all different, so what may be difficult for one may not be difficult for another, but just discuss that. The second question is this, why is it important for us not just to hear God's voice, but also to follow him? Why is that important for us not just to hear his voice, but also to make sure that we follow him? Now, let me just go on. If you're back in verse 10, 
chapter 10 of verse of verse of chapter 10 of verse if you're back in if you're back in chapter 10 <laughs> let's go on let's go let's go back to chapter 10 verse 27 of chapter 10 i want to read verse 27 and 28 Verse 27 says, For my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, verse 29, who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And so Jesus says, these sheep that I have that have believed in me, that hear my voice, that follow me, that I know by name. He says, I'm going to give them eternal life and they will never perish. They will never they will never be judged. They will never be, be sentenced uh, uh, to, ju to judgment. He says, and they're in my hand and no one can snatch them out of my. I am so glad that my salvation is not dependent upon me holding on to Jesus. Because if it's helped me holding Jesus, I would have let go a long time ago. But it's based on him holding on to me. He's got me. And then he says, my father who gave him to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch him out of my father's hand. And verse 30 says, and I and the father are one. What a great, what a great encouragement to know that. That God gives us eternal life and we shall never perish. It reminds me of what he says in John 3.16. And we're all very familiar with John 3.16. He says in John, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes, whosoever will put their trust in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is what Jesus gives to those who put their faith in him. And listen, I, I, I want to thank you for coming and listening to this, but I don't know where you are spiritually. And maybe you have never come to a place where you've ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you don't realize that God has loved you so much that Jesus died for you. And he says that if you would put your faith and you would believe in him, he's going to give you eternal life and he's going to take away judgment from you. Isn't that a great? In fact, in John 10, 10, he says there, he says that I came to give them life and to give them life more abundantly, to give them exceeding abundant life. God has all these things he wants to give to us. But it comes as we trust in him, as we put our faith in him, believe in him. If, if, if you're here today and, and you're visiting, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I, I, I want to give you that opportunity to realize, one, that we can't get to heaven on our own because we have a sin problem. But, but Christ died for our sins because God loved us. He demonstrated his love toward us that Jesus took my place and died. And he said, if you would receive that, I'll give you eternal life. If, if, if you would just right where you are, just bow your head. And just pray to God. This is not a prayer to anybody else. Just pray to God. Lord, I realize that you love me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that he rose again. And you promised to give me eternal life. I want to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you prayed that prayer before, I want you to know there's nothing magical about that prayer, but God sees the heart of a person who prays that prayer. And if you've done that, what I want you to do, I, I, I want you to contact somebody. Contact somebody who invited you to this, this, uh, this service today. Or what you can do is, is, is go on our website. Go on our website and send us an email because we'd love to send you some information about what it means to walk with Jesus Christ, what it means to be a sheep of Jesus Christ because he loves us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for being here and being a part. Father, right now, I want to thank you for everyone who's here who's able to listen. I pray, Lord God, that you'd meet their needs right now. I pray that in this state of confusion, that you'd give us your peace, that you'd show us how to love well, that, Lord God, you would strengthen our faith, that we would realize that even though things around us may be uncertain, that you are certain and we can trust you. For those who may have financial issues, who may have lost their jobs right now, Lord God, I pray that you would encourage them. I, I, I cry out for the health workers, 
We pray for them and we pray that you sustain them and give them strength and you protect them and protect their families. And Father, we're going to trust you through this. Give us your peace. Show yourself strong. We're praying that men and women and children would come to know Jesus Christ, that your church would learn how to pray, that you would be calling us to a greater level of holiness and trust in you. And we'll be sure to give you all praise in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you and may you keep trusting in him.